just just to mention just for two minutes ago I already quote some of your intervention in our in our courses so to, to show you how relevant we think you are for the benefit of our students of our courses so I'm really thankful for having you here and uh, I'm sure that your um, intervention will be very beneficial for the course of our course and for the benefit of, uh, of all our students. Thank you very much. I'll leave the floor. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's absolutely my honor to join everybody this year for the, um, this workshop or conference. Um, in the meantime, I would like to congratulate you on your appointment at the center. The center is absolutely lucky to have you. Um, thanks to Marco for extending the invitation. It has been very kind of you. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about my background. First of all, I, I have to apologize for being late, uh, later than um, scheduled on, on the schedule, uh, my intervention. So I'm completely mortified and I'm so sorry for that. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I worked in Afghanistan as Deputy Minister for Interior Affairs, which is the main body for or the main institution for policing in Afghanistan or the law enforcement in Afghanistan um, from 2018 to 2021. Um, it clearly says that I was there in the last years of the US and NATO presence in Afghanistan in the security and defense sector. Um, I can't say it was too late, but it was kind of late to push for this civilian policing or stability policing in Afghanistan. And what I'm sharing with you today is um, during those three years, how much did we feel that uh, if Afghanistan had employed stability policing as an approach post 2001, or at least um, in the later years, but earlier than 2018, uh, the stability operation would have been would have had a different outcome, surely. Um, so the post two thousand one, when the invasion happened, the Afghan Afghanistan itself didn't have any armed forces, uh, and then the armed forces in Afghanistan was established. The institutions uh, were established in Afghanistan, and I'm very sure that some of you have been part of it. Um, on behalf of your own countries, on behalf of NATO countries. Uh, but regardless of which institution, we had three main institution, which was the Ministry of Defense, which led the army, Ministry of Interior Affairs, which led the police forces and then Ministry and then Directorate for um, Intelligence, which was um, delivering the mandate of intelligence body. But regardless of which institution, the entire sector were um, uh, prioritize not just prioritize it, but it, the sole focus of, of the entire institutions uh, prior to 2014 have been counterterrorism. And then later on, the uh, mandate or the focus was a little bit, or at least the, the approach, I can't say the focus, but the approach was a little bit um, diverted. I mean, a little bit inclusive of counter insurgency as well. Uh, or at least that was a term that you that was used in the later years. Policing, I don't think, has ever been a priority. Policing, in a sense that the Afghan government has felt or has been responsible to protect its citizens from criminality or any other uh, activities, or at least to provide the policing services. Uh, yes, we did talk about it. Yes, it was part of the police law in Afghanistan, but. If we could look at the resources allocated for policing versus counter narcotics and terrorism, uh, it could tell you a different story of uh, the situation. So in Afghanistan, we had out of 124,000 uh, police forces plus 30,000 local police, um, uh, um, I mean, local police force. The local police force was always mandated for counterinsurgency. They had no policing mandate at all. And we also had small police forces, um, which again have been mandated on protection of either VIPs or counterinsurgency or um, any other mandate. But the actual police who used to deliver the policing mandate have been 16,000 of a uh, hundred 
54,000 plus police force, which was around 10% of the entire police force. So they have been the only policing, uh, the only unit which have been mandated or trained, equipped, um, and expected to deliver the mandate of policing in Afghanistan. So that was all we had. The rest of the police that we had in Afghanistan, they have been deployed in remote check posts on the top of a mountain or in a desert, not even among the people, like within communities. Um, and their main job when we have been doing a study of the a study in order to initiate the security sector reform. So what we found out was that um, the police check posts are the base or the, the primary encounter with the insurgency and terrorism in Afghanistan. So that's also why the police uh, forces have bared more casualty than the army in Afghanistan. So the first, or, or I would say the, the first outer circle of um, countering insurgency and terrorism was the police. And then we had the army. In a way, police was protecting the army. So we had the army as the uh, second circle. And then again, we had the police um, as the third circle. So it's like a police had created two circles um, around the army. So it, it's like, um, from my perspective, it's in a way to protect the army, both from the public and at the same time from insurgents and the um, um, and the terrorist uh, and the terrorist activities. But at the same time, let's also acknowledge that internally the uh, creation of the institutions in such a way was also political. But externally, from an international um, uh, perspective, I mean an international. Uh, community's perspective that that was something i mean police was used as an auxiliary force to the army because they felt the army is not enough to counter insurgency and terrorism that's why we have to deploy police officers as well the other reason why police have been um, bearing more casualty extremely more casualty was because they have not been equipped and sometimes they have even if they have been equipped they have not been trained to counter insurgency or terrorism in Afghanistan. Um, so that was part of the reason that people have been frustrated with the uh, policing services in Afghanistan or their own protection. They felt that the government has failed to protect its citizens. Um, part of it, it was that it, there was not re much resources on the ground, but at the same time, they could see that there is a huge body of police and they're not doing the actual policing because police was um, busy elsewhere. Um, so that was the situation, um, I mean, in terms of how the institutions have been formed or in, in terms of how the institutions have been structured and how they were mandated. But on the other side, if you could go, I mean, on the political side of it and how policing could have helped Afghanistan, I would say could have even contributed for the Afghan government to maintain its legitimacy. Um, Post 2000, I mean, around 2001, uh, 2021, um, it would have been like post 2001. Let me tell you um, the, the, the story of how people could perceive the government, and then I'm going to come back to two, 2021 case of, of the Afghan government's collapse. When we would have gone to a remote or um, a third grade in Afghanistan, we had different grades of the provinces. So a third grade province is a province that does not earn enough revenue, but at the same time does not receive enough resources. If we would have gone to a third um, grade province in Afghanistan, we could have barely uh, seen a governance presence in Afghanistan in terms of protecting the citizens beyond army bases who are locked, who doesn't want to connect with people and that's not their job to connect with people. Um, and the check posts are not within communities. The, the police check posts are at the top of mountains again or in a desert in Afghanistan. Uh, so, I mean, how the Afghan government had presented itself to the communities in rural areas and remote areas was that uh, they had entered, they had taken the territory post 2001 from the Taliban through an army, a strong army, and that has been uh, surely led by the international armed uh, forces. And then it remained, that image remained with people. 
The second thing that should have happened was that the police forces should have entered there in order to um, first protect the citizens, provide the services, but at the same time um, facilitate the establishment of other institutions and services to the people. But that was something that I don't say it did, did not exist, but it was very weak. That image of the government was very weak. Uh, and, and trust me, for most of the uh, in most of the provinces, countering the Taliban could have been done through polices, through police forces, or law enforcement with the public on their side, rather than the army. Um, it would have been more successful because police is the only one who can connect with people, who can engage with them, who can gather intel, um, and at the same time does not take casualty from people. So one of the grievances that the people had was because of the army's operation counterinsurgency and counter um, um, terrorism operation. The other side of why I've always been an advocate of policing in Afghanistan and stability policing in Afghanistan, which has been a, a I can't say a post-conflict setting, Afghanistan was an in-conflict setting between 2001 to 2021. The other reason is because the major grievance of the people in rural areas and remote areas has been the civilian casualty due again due to the operations. The casualty could have been minimized. I, I can't talk about the casualty, how the casualty could have been minimized, or did we have the maximum casualty as a byproduct of that war? Or could we have more than uh, less than that? I mean, I can't talk about it. The, the uh, operations must have taken every step to minimize it. But there's always an aftermath of the operation, and that is something that police could do it because the army can't do it. Um, delivering justice, talking to people, being in the community. In some community, and that, that happened to be very rare, rare communities, where we had active police, they could take care of the aftermath of an operation, where we had uh, civilians killed in an operation, children killed in an operation, in an operation or women uh, killed in, in an operation. Uh, so there, there could have been police officers or police forces on the ground with the skills, the training, and the um, the communication skill, the connection with the people uh, to take care of that aftermath. The grievance that I'm talking about was exactly the grievance that was one of the factors that people withdrew their support in the later years from the central government. Um, yes, again, I have to acknowledge that when people withdrew their support from the central government, they did not sign up for the Taliban, but they just remained uh, without any choice. They chose nothing because we could not offer them anything. And politically, that was a political cost that the government um, bared in, I mean, over years, but then, of course, the result was in 2021. Of course, that was one, one of the reasons why the Taliban have been able to recruit more and more over time. I mean, the Taliban, which was non-existent almost uh, in 2006-2005. Um, the other aspect of the civilian policing that, uh, I mean, has made me as a woman in the security and defense sector as a big act advocate for stability policing is that that is within the security and defense uh, institution. That is where we can, I mean, that is a um, field that can accommodate more and more women for the reason that the society is composed of both men and women, regardless of how in conflict or post conflict the society is, how conservative a society is. That's the first um, layer of the security and defense, I mean, uh, sector that society and at the same time for women. Uh, the society accepts women, but at the same time, women can join the sector, having all the responsibilities around. So that is one area that I would say. Um, has the maximum capacity compared to army in a country like Afghanistan or intelligence that um, can mainstream gender, different genders across the country. So that is another reason that uh, I've always believed that stability policing is not as an approach is not only effective due to um, the very technical reason, but it's also because it's inclusive. I mean, it can be more inclusive compared to army, compared to um, um, compared to the army only. Uh, 
And part of it is because they bring different skill set, they bring different uh, connections to the community, to their communities and society, and they bring different level of influence to their communities and society. Um, and the last, um, um, I would say, uh, reason that I would advocate for stability policing is that. Um, let me just pull. Uh, am I connected to the system? I disconnected for a second. Uh, can everybody hear my voice? So, the last reason that I would, um, I mean, I would support community, uh, I would support stability policing, at least in countries like Afghanistan, um, is because it paves the way from um, an army intervention. I mean, it is, it is like a bridge. In Afghanistan, we had the trouble we had in, in most parts where we didn't even need an army, we needed more police officers in, in some of the urban cities, the major, uh, I would say, um, developed areas in Afghanistan. We, the, the biggest challenge that we had was that transition from the army responsibility to uh, or from that battlefield mentality of always either going offensive and countering terrorism or um, um, insurgents to that guardianship, that mentality, transitioning from the, I mean, from a mentality of going after terrorism or insurgency to guarding people, um, or transitioning from the army's responsibility, taking responsibility of securing or maintaining security in, a, in an area to a, a policing mentality or to guardianship mentality. I think that transition almost did not happen. There has been a lot of efforts going on. Even the police had that mentality of um, defending or that mentality of defending from terrorism or insurgency or going offensive. So we did not have that mentality even. And that transition, at least during my journey at, in the uh, security and defense sector, um, there has been a lot of efforts going on, but it did not happen. Uh, I mean, let me be clear. Part of it was because the police felt they look cool. They look more fashionable if they act like an army. Um, and part of the reason was that that mentality was ingrained so deeply among all the forces, regardless of which branch they are, that it, it became difficult actually to transition to that. And what I'm thinking of, I mean, the reason that I do believe that stability policing would have been a different tool, a different approach in Afghanistan. Um, it was also because that could have been a bridge to transition to, to make that transition happen. Um, from, I mean, yes, it, it makes sense post 2001 immediately. Everybody had to be a, maybe an army or even um, post 2001. Not everybody had to be, be an army in terms of. Being equipped, yes, being equipped, being skilled to fight an enemy when they had to, but they also needed to have that um, communication skill, that community engagement skill. And I think that is something that stability policing could bring. Maybe not civilian policing. Civilian policing may not have been in that in the middle of that chaos, may not have been the right tool, but stability policing could have been something in between the uh, two of them. That's how I see stability policing as a, a better approach or better tool in um, in an operation in the early stages of the operation. But in the later stages of the operation, again, that facilitates that transformation from um, um, a very, I would say, battlefield mentality to a guardianship mentality among the people. Um, that's it at my end. Uh, it has been an honor. It has been a pleasure joining everybody. Uh, for this year's uh, event, I wish I had been able to listen to everybody in terms of the throughout the conference. 
and had the opportunity to learn more from everybody. Uh, thank you so much again for having me. Thank you. Uh, it was, uh, again, it's very, it's very, uh, let's say, uh, moving also listen to your experience from a technical perspective of being Afghan and such a high level official Afghan that reached such a great results and, uh, and we really feel close to you and to Afghan people, and that's why it's more, but even more important for us to listen to your, uh, your, uh, your ideas, your, your insights, and to try to transform this into be better, to work better, to be more effective. If, if you agree now, uh, I would ask if anybody from the, from the uh, has any question. From the center. Uh, Colonel Hot, I'm with the U.S. military. Uh, quick question. Um, I know uh, in sight, uh, we have a perfect vision of what should have happened versus what actually did happen. So um, I totally acknowledge and I agree with you in terms of if we did have more policing, uh, the reception. Uh, the local population would have been uh, more receptive to the ISAF forces. But uh, from your from your assessment, do you think it was feasible for the local um, law enforcement forces to conduct stability policing during those periods? Realistically speaking, uh, I would say yes. So he, here's the thing, the reason that I divided stability policing with civilian policing post 2001 immediately after the invasion was because uh, that I actually, that's something that we have been designing in 2018 with, with the security uh, sector reform. We have been trying to design uh, first to separate police uh, from the army because police, again, was the auxiliary force of the army. They have been doing exactly the same thing as the army. So from my perspective, yes, it was feasible, maybe not civilian policing um, in the communities immediately after the invasion. Later, yes, uh, over time, because that is another level of policing, of course, in, in the community. But stability policing, yes, absolutely. If we could recruit uh, as many in the police, officers as uh, in, in the police forces, as many we could do in the army. Plus, there's one thing that I need to share here is that the recruitment rate in the police was always higher than the army. Army have always had a 30,000 uh, members um, less. I mean, a deficit in terms of, um, I, I don't know if that's the right term to be used. They have not been able to fill 30,000 of their uh, ranks in the um, army, but the police was always, uh, the, the slots for the police was always full. So it basically means first, people have been more into policing in terms of joining the service. And at the same time, I do believe, yes, that the, in, in post 2001, it was feasible. If police was better equipped, um, better trained and um, um, I would say mandated to go out in the communities. I do believe that yes, stability policing, yes. Civilian policing, maybe no, post 2001 immediate, uh, the immediate uh, post 2001 uh, time or time frame. Um, and again, when we are talking about the, uh, what could have been done better, we all have made, I mean, both the Afghan government, the international community have made the best choices back then. The reason that we reflect now is that uh, we are thinking what could have been done better so that we could have a different outcome. And again, we are using it as a lessons learned for maybe future uh, interventions of NATO or any other country. And for us as Afghans, if we would have the chance to reestablish a democratic state again, uh, maybe in decades, maybe in years. Um, but if, I mean, from an Afghan perspective, if we would ever be, be able to 
the Afghans, if the Afghans would ever be able to reestablish a democratic state, the core pillar of that democratic state would definitely be policing and surely stability policing. And let me bring something interesting from a, a very recent uh, opinion poll that we had among Afghan youth from Afghanistan, particularly. Um, the question for them was what kind of and government for Afghanistan would be the most feasible and the most uh, ideal for the Afghan youth, which makes majority of the population. Um, they, I mean, in different ways or different approaches, they had, exp I mean, their, their opinion, if I would summarize it, is that clearly a democratic state where the rule of law should be established and should be strong enough. Um, so from my perspective, I mean, what I would take out of all the essays that I read from all the Afghan youth is that, yes, again, they felt that the previous uh, central government has been weak because of that rule of law element to it. So I do believe, yes, it's not easy, um, but that's the only way to bring stability. Um, engaging with the communities compared to like uh, stationing all the armed forces in bases is very different. It's very difficult. It's very tricky. It requires more skills than, uh, I mean, um, than required. But at the same time, that's the only way to over time minimize the cost of um, security and stability. But at the same time, to have community alongside the armed forces, that's the only way. We don't want community to turn against the armed forces. There has to be a, a channel of communication and a flow of communication, and only somebody who is always among them can do that. Not somebody who goes out among the community once every week uh, from a base. They would be seen as a strangers, as a foreigners, regardless if that's an Afghan or that's an international uh, force, regardless of what uniform they they carry, uh, that they wear. So um, that that has been my observation uh, in terms of how feasible the uh, I would say the um, stability policing is in a country like Afghanistan. It is, but it has challenges. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. And as you mentioned before, just I would like to underline the fact that a few minutes ago we were discussing how stability policing itself is a, a bridging factor among worlds, right? And as you mentioned, policing is the interface, the bridge between people and the governance, and it's the, actually the, the first responder to the needs of people. That's that's relevant policing, and that's also what stability policing is trying to do in the in the military work, in the military operations, and this is very relevant. Any other question from? I again, thank you very much. Uh, it's always an honor, an honor, very, and a pleasure to to listen to your to your comments. And I really hope that uh, we'll see you soon in our courses and maybe in person to enrich our, our, our products for the benefit of the international community and of NATO. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. It has been an absolute honor for me to join everybody. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day.